It's so great to be celebrating Mother's Day here this morning. It's so good to see your gorgeous faces here in the house of God. You know, our hearts and our thoughts go out to all the people who've lost mums, all those women who have experienced uh, even loss of children and miscarriages. We, our heart goes out to you. No matter what kind of mum or how you identify as a mum, if you're a stepmom, a foster mum, a biological mum, whether you're just a mum in the faith, hey, we are so glad that you are here today. It is just gonna be a fantastic morning. And you know, I actually hope that you got breakfast in bed this morning. Did anyone get breakfast in bed? Some people did, Mm mm-hmm, well done. Well, you know, I actually didn't think that I was a breakfast in bed type person, you know, like the cold coffee and the crumbs and and all that sort of stuff. But get this, last week, my husband brought me a coffee in bed, right? And I know, he's so great. And it was awesome and I loved it. And you know what, even though I think it was just a subtle message that it's time to get up, kids need to uh, have some food and, you know, I don't care what the message was. I took it. It was amazing. And if we could keep that going, (laughs) that would be really great. (laughs) Yeah, thanks. I know all the women, you appreciate that as well. Well, um, this morning we have got a panel. I'm going to be interviewing two incredible women, but before they come up, I actually just want to set the scene. So if you've got your Bibles with you, you can turn to Luke chapter 1. And in Luke chapter one, we know the story or we see the story of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Now, Mary is probably the most famous mother in the Bible, maybe aside from Eve. And um, we, most of you probably know her story. Her story goes that she was a young woman engaged to be married. And uh, that was until the angel of God came to her and said to her, look, you have actually been chosen by God to, um, to supernaturally fall pregnant, not with a man, but by the power of the Holy Spirit to carry um, a child who you're gonna call his name Jesus. And he's actually gonna be the saviour of the world, right? And I can imagine Mary in this moment, cause she was human, right? I can imagine her thinking like this, this, this call that has just been, I guess, placed over my life, like it's huge, right? doesn't just influence my life, but my people have been thinking about the coming Messiah and prophesying about it for a really long time. It's gonna influence and impact people for eternity. And not only that, it was gonna impact her life, her relationships, her reputation, and her understanding of God in that moment. I can imagine her thinking like, is this for real? Like, was this a pizza dream? I mean, when someone gets pregnant, it takes like four months before the physical evidence of the pregnancy is actually seen. I can imagine her thinking, like, like, what does this look like? How do I do it? But the angel goes on to say to Mary these words in verse 36. And uh, the angel says, even Elizabeth, your relative is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month for no word from God will ever fail. You know, church, God in His incredible ability to make everything work together for good actually says to Mary, you know, your cousin Elizabeth, supernaturally, she and her husband husband have actually fallen pregnant. She is advanced in in years. She has been unable to conceive and fall pregnant. And I wanna let you know right now that I've actually already met her six months ago, and if you go to her and if you see, you'll actually see the evidence of God that God's Word never fails. And you can actually trust this Word as a result. You see, God set it up that Mary alone was the mother of Jesus, but she wasn't alone. She wasn't alone in her journey. God had already moved in Elizabeth's life. God had already ordained for this thing to happen. Elizabeth was her cousin was a person in her community, a person that she could run to, a person that she actually did run to and that she could see the evidence of God moving in her life. And in that moment, Mary could, um, I guess, build her faith for the journey ahead because of what she could see. And she needed that because she wasn't called to actually walk it alone. Now church, we are not called to individualistic Christianity. Those two words, they actually, they should never go together. They actually don't go together. We are called to collective. We are called to community. We are called to lean on and learn from and be encouraged and be inspired by other one another's stories. 
so that it can encourage us in our faith journey and so that we can then encourage others in their faith journey. You know, so many women feel the weight of motherhood. Am I right? And it's only intensified when we walk it alone and we are not called, we are not created to walk it alone. And I guess that is my heart for our panel this morning is that I have two incredible women, lovers of Jesus, who have seen the power of God outworked in their life. And I hope this morning that your hearts are open because I believe that God wants to inspire you. God wants to encourage you. God wants to speak to you as you hear their testimonies. Let it build your faith this morning. And uh, that's gonna be it from me for this moment. So I'd love it if you could stand to your feet as we welcome our panel members this morning, Raylene Wern and Jess Woodhouse. Thanks guys, take your seat. Thanks church. Well, like I said, these women, uh, they're a part of our church. They love Jesus. They still love their kids. You know, all the like criteria for actually sharing on Mother's Day. And um, you know, they use the gifts upon their life to build the kingdom of God and the, the house of God. And so I, let me just introduce them to you. So uh, I'll start with Raylene. Raylene is a mother of six children. She has 13 grandchildren. She is married to an awesome guy named Steve and together they serve on our Connect team. Raylene also runs a mother, uh, sorry, not a mother's group, a women's group here at church. And some of you might know, some of you may not know that Raylene actually also runs and fully supports two orphanages in Thailand, uh, which has been ongoing since 2007. She first ran these with her first, uh, with her husband, Mark, who sadly passed away. And now together with her husband, Steve, actually doing an incredible work over there. So Raylene, you're an incredible woman. Jess also is another incredible woman in our church. She has four kids. You'll probably normally see her with her three boys at church. She does have an older daughter as well. Jess is part of our eKids crèche program, but she also teaches at our prophetic training course on Wednesday night. Jess also runs and teaches an online training in the prophetic and is also part of our Bible college as well. So two absolutely fantastic women. And so I'm just gonna jump straight into our first question. And so girls, you know, you're both women of incredible faith. You're the kind of, these are the kind of people that you want to hang around with. They're the kind of people that you want in your life. They're generous, they're kind, uh, they're empowering, they're all those sort of things. And sometimes when you meet people like this, you can think, of course they're like that. Their life's been easy. <laughs> like, it, the, you know, that's just the gifting on their life or God's just favoured them, uh, you know, and, you know, it makes sense that your life is like that. But the truth is, is that the people we see today, the people that we know today, actually really a product of deep encounter with God, right? And so, Jess, this wasn't always your story. And I wonder if you could just let us know what your journey to God has been like. So my journey to God has been a 30-year process. Um, I didn't grow up in a Christian household. I grew up in an extremely dysfunctional household. Um, my mum was really young. My father was a lot older and he was a sociopath. Uh, so as you can imagine, that makes for a bit of a nightmare. Um, and it did. So, you know, along the journey, um, God saved my brother first um, and then my mum and, and obviously it worked down the line. But before that happened, um, you know, life was really hard. I was really angry with God. I couldn't understand who this God who supposedly loved me would allow me to go through such heartache, such pain. Um, and to give you context in that, by the time I was 13, my father had been diagnosed with motor neuro disease and he was about a year from passing away. My mum had moved to New South Wales with my little sister, half-sister, and my brother was living with my auntie. So our family was very destroyed and very disconnected. Uh, by this time, as you can imagine, I was very angry. I was bitter. Um, I was on and off the streets um, and found myself involved with drug addicts and uh, gangs and people who were career criminals. Um, and facing jail uh, for doing things that were less than legal, um, trying to survive, trying to find who I was. I had a deep-seated hate for myself and for the world, and that included God. Um, it didn't make sense. I couldn't marry a God who loved me and a God who would allow me to walk through this. 
And so, as you can imagine, the enemy jumps on that, right? And he feeds into that lie and he brings people around you who use and manipulate you in order to further kill and destroy whatever hope that you have left uh, and whatever self-esteem that you may have survived with, right? Um, And so, you know, my life was very, very messed up. Well into my adult life, I married a man who was an addict, who was the product of, um, you know, parents who had been in and out of jail all their life extremely violent, extremely aggressive. And so, you know, life gets worse, right? And then you bring your own children into the mix and it gets messy. <laughs> um, and so about, I was about 21, I gave my life to God uh, in a church in Sydney. Um, and I thought that life was going to be smooth sailing, right? That idea that God saves you and you're good um, was what I had in my mind. And that was not what happened. (laughs) So I encountered religion. Um, I may have given my life to Jesus, but I certainly hadn't given my heart to him because I didn't trust him. I didn't trust me. And I'd learned really early that if I mess up, then the only person I've got to hate is me. And I already hated me, so that didn't matter. That's easy, right? Um, If other people let me down, then I've got to be hurt by them. And I wasn't willing to let people do that. Uh, So uh, journey and, you know, went on for another sort of 15 or so years uh, and it got to the point where I was in my third relationship uh, onto my last son, uh, Jimmy, who is, if you guys don't know, my three boys are all special needs. Um, you can't see that they're special needs because it's autism and intellectual disabilities, um, however they are. And so it got to the point where, you know, my last partner was um, extremely narcissistic and abusive. And I was convinced that I was crazy and my children were messed up because it was me. It was something wrong with me. I was unlovable. I was unfixable. Um, And then if I was gone, life would be good for them. That I was doing them a favour if I had finally done what I was going to, what I was contemplating doing and committing suicide. So it got really messy. I got really dangerous. And I got to the point where one night in my bed, I just lied down and said, you know what, God, if you're real... Fix this because I can't. I'm done. I'm done. So if you're real, I need you to show up. Um, And yeah, and the rest is the story from there, which will unfold, obviously, in the questions. Wow. It's incredible. And Raylene, it's this very, well, there are some similar aspects to your story as well. You know, what did it look like before you came to know God? So all my life, I always was told that you're not supposed to be here, you're not wanted. So I really felt that pain of rejection. I lived in a very dysfunctional home. There was a lot of abuse. I was sexually abused. Uh, I was, there was a lot of molestation in my world. And I a lot of hurt and no self-esteem. I had no identity. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know who I was supposed to be. Um, my mum, one wonderful thing was my mum sent me to a Catholic school. So I did believe in a God, but I had no idea that I could have a relationship with him. Anyway, who would want to know God? Because men in my world were the ones that hurt me. You know, my biological father, I never met him. Um, he's passed away. Um, I, I, the father who raised me, rejected me, said, you're not my, my daughter anyway, so I don't want anything more to do with you. So I never had a relationship with him. I tried several times and I never, I never had a relationship. And um, when he died, I tried to go see him and I wasn't allowed. So, I, so the men in my world were very, um, you know, they were, they were rejecting me. And so I looked at God like that as well because, you know, that's the men in my world. So when I was very young and, and 14, I left home and my boyfriend at the time was in a bikey gang. So I thought, this is family. This is what I'm after. This is, this is you know, what you're looking for. And so I thought, yeah, okay. So I lived at the bikey house with, with the bikers and I thought, this is it. And we do raids together and I was very violent. And that was one way of me easing my pain and and letting the the violence out and the anger out. And so I thought, yeah, this is this is my answer. But as you know, the devil only gives you a counterfeit. It's not my answer at all. And I married that man. I had a little boy because I was pregnant. And and then just after he was born, he left and and he committed suicide. And then I met another man um, called Mark and 
Mark and I met in a um, hotel and um, oh, we would get drunk together and we had a great relationship. Yeah, right. <laughs> and and um, he was an alcoholic. I became an alcoholic. I smoked. Um, I took marijuana and stuff like that. And I, I had a lot of problems in my world, as you could imagine. And I, again, found myself pregnant. And um, I carried um, that little baby to birth and... She sadly passed away. And it was through that time that I, someone introduced me to Jesus. And I just thought, how could, how could God love me? How could he love someone who was so messed up and who had no self-worth and who was so dirty from what I'd been through and unclean and, and who no one wanted? And I shouldn't even be here, so why would he want me? And the most beautiful thing was that when I, when I come to know God, I just cried on my bed and I just said, if you're real, you need to show yourself to me. And he, his presence came into the room. I, I can't describe it. It was tangible and I knew it was God. And he just wiped me clean. He washed me and he took away all, all that pain. He took away the drinking, the alcohol, the um, alcohol. He just, it was just such an incredible experience. And I can't tell you how long I was on that bed in my bedroom for. I think it was hours. I've got no idea. But I know when I got up off that bed, I was a new woman. I was a different woman. And I had encountered God and I, that I would never, ever be the same again. And that's the story of my life. I've never been the same again. And even though I was married to Mark, and uh, he was an alcoholic still. He didn't want to go my direction. Um, he, so for 22 years, he still drank and he did what he did. But after that, and I just, God gave me a promise for him to keep trusting and believing him. God told me that he would put him together in my world and I could trust him to believe for my husband. And after 22 years, he gloriously got saved and we created a ministry together and um, like, Pastor Kate said we started orphanages in Thailand and a ministry over there and, and then um, sadly he passed away over there of a heart attack. But you know, God's, God's a good God. He, he gave me Steve after that as well. So he's, oh, anyway, I'll go back to you, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> no, Otherwise great. I'll say too much. One of the things I really love about these stories is that, you know, some, like God doesn't need a system to bring salvation and to encounter people. Systems are really great and powerful, but the thing that, that God moves through is an open heart, whether it's in a church service, whether it's in your bedroom, you know, whether it's sitting, sitting with a friend. When there's a heart that's desperate to encounter with God, He is faithful to meet us where we're at. And I just love that for both of you guys, it was that, that desperation, that heart to connect with God. So my next question is, what did it mean to you when you first really experienced the love of God? So what did it mean? You have these backgrounds. Um, what did that look like for you? So that night when I encountered um, God in that moment, it wasn't this big booming moment. Um, and it wasn't for me like it was for Aileen because we're all different, right? And we all need something different. And the wonderful thing about God is that he designed us and He knows what we need in the moment. And He really does come and meet us in the individual need as we are who we are. Um, and so in that moment, um, I knew something had happened. And the funny thing was that the next day, my brother from America rang me and he said, hey, Jess, did you pray something last night? I'm like, whoa, okay. <laughs> I wasn't just dreaming, you know, this is real. Um, for me, like that one moment, it wasn't enough. I needed, you know, I needed to go on this journey with God of unravelling the mistrust and, and the self-loathing and the hate of, of people in general because I didn't like me and I didn't like anybody else. Um, and so he knew that I needed a journey that was a little bit different. That intense encounter that changed me forever wasn't gonna be enough to keep me. And he knew that, right? Because he's a God of the long term, not just the fix it now band-aid deal, right? Um, and so he, you know, a long journey, he kind of like, things got messy. The next couple of days were really messy. I had three children. I was, you know, living in a hostile home and we had five minutes to pack a basket of school uniforms because we were leaving because it was unsafe. Um, and, and we had no family. We had no money. We had no access to anything. 
And even though in that moment, it was the scariest thing I'd ever been through in my life. And I've opened the door to men with baseball bats. <laughs> you know, this was extreme, right? For me even. Um, I had this sense of peace, this completeness in me that I had never, ever felt in all my life, even though everything was a mess and there looked like it was hopeless. I had this profound hope that I knew that I just needed to hang on to and just keep putting one foot in front of the other. And even though I didn't know the plan, even though I didn't know what was gonna happen, in my mind, it looked impossible. I knew that God was there, He had heard what I spoke and that for whatever reason, He had placed this gift of faith inside of me that I just needed to hang on to and watch what He did with it. I had to choose to be intentional. I had to choose to trust Him because he was choosing to trust me. And so it didn't feel like a whopping moment, but it felt like something inside me that had just anchored on to who he was and was unwilling to let go. Wow, I absolutely love that. You know, um, Raylene, you started to, I guess, answer my next question. So I'm gonna jump you to that question um, and then we'll flick over to Jess. So both of you had this identity, really, that was formed in your childhood. And we know, and the research says, um, that we, we kind of repeat the patterns um, to, when we parent our child, the patterns that we were parented in ourselves. unless we, you know, do some work around that, you know, we parent out of the identity that we were parented in, mm. right? And um, my question to you is, how did God take you on that journey of deconstruction and rebuild when it came to your identity? Yeah, God's Word is amazing, isn't it? He took me through Scriptures and showed me, you know, like in Psalm 139, where it says that God formed you in your mother's womb and He saw the days. And when I read that, I was just like, wow, like God ordained for my life. You know, these other things were lies of my life. They weren't, um, that's what people had told me, but that was not the truth, that the truth was what God's Word says. So I had to base my life on what God says now and what He says about me and not what the world says, not even my mother, what my mother said. And I just want to add in there that I have a wonderful relationship with my mum and um, her and I are really close right now. So just letting you know that, you know, God is a God of restoration. And, you know, um, so when I, when I could see that I, I was wanted by God, that changed everything that God got me here. He got me here in these circumstances. And out of that, He's now given me a ministry. And that's why I do what I do overseas. You know, I rescue children because I don't want them hurting. I want them to know the love of God. I don't want them rejected. I want them to see and feel the love of God that someone cares about them and what His Word says about them and what, what God says about you. Nothing can change that. And especially when it goes from here to here. Nothing can take that away from, you know, from you. No, no, nothing. And it's just so beautiful what God can do in your world when you trust Him. And, you know, that trust takes a while. It just doesn't, oh, yeah, let's just trust Him. You know, it takes, it, it takes a while to be able to, to say yes and be vulnerable before God and to be able to lay your life down. And as we um, said that song this morning, you know, we surrender and it's just, you know, surrendering every day and saying, yes, Lord, I allow you to have your way in my life and for you to come and do with me what you wanna do. And sometimes, you know, I would point my finger at Mark and God would say, Raylene, there's three pointing back at you. You know, let's deal with you. We can't, we're not gonna change him, we're gonna change you. Change the way you respond to him. You know, let's look at you. And through that, God just started to do a transformation in my life and in my world. And Jess, what did that look like for you? Um, yes, so for me, um, you know, I was really broken. Um, I didn't know who I was. I didn't even know the things that I liked. Um, I had no idea of what made me happy um, or even actually where the line of what I thought was acceptable behaviour was. They were all so blurred and so messed up that I actually had to go on this journey with God of finding who I was. Um, and that man, you know, um, accepting what he said about me. So God said something to me early on and it was true humility is actually agreeing with what I say about you. 
So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't even just a case of, you know, going, oh, you know, I'm, I'm a good person. It was, okay, what does that look like? You know, if you're saying I'm a good person, why do you say that? You know, he led me to verses, I think it's Isaiah 43, and it says, you know, because you are precious and honoured and I love you, I give nations in your place. And I'm like, whoa, hang on a moment. If I'm precious and honoured and you love me by the creator of the universe, then what does that look like? How do I work that into who I am, right? Um, because, you know, something that God spoke to me about, particularly within rebuilding who I was, was, you know, not, reaction, not reacting out of reaction because the people that I dealt with all my life were broken people who were breaking other people. And part of learning who I was was learning how to forgive even those people that did atrocious things right? Because they were just broken people who God loves just as much as He loves me. And they deserve to know God just as much as I deserve to know God, right? Um, and so that was the part of my journey. Well, it wasn't just unpicking what they'd said or, or what I thought about me, but it was also unpicking the bitterness and the resentment and the anger that I held because you know, here I am, like I'm, you know, I was 35 years old with three children with special needs and I literally had nothing, nothing. Like, and we kind of go, oh yeah, okay, they're just things. No, they're not. They're not. Let's be real, guys. They're not just things. You hold on to them because they're security, right? You've worked hard in your life because they're things that you achieve along the way. And when they're taken, you have to learn the reality of who you are without those things. And that is a real hard thing to go through. And so, you know, unpicking all of that, right, in order to learn who I was. And part of that was that because of what Jesus did on the cross, I actually have the same ability to walk in the same forgiveness, the same love, the same grace, the same generosity, the same victories that He walked in, right? Not because I earned it, not because I deserved it, because I've been through a life of trash, no because He paid for it, because He loved me, because I'm precious and honoured and He loves me, right? And so I had to unpick the things that I identified as being how we look at ourselves so that I could react out of identity and behave out of identity instead of reaction to the world or what I thought the world decided was a good reaction. And so that was part of the journey for me. That's awesome. You know what I love about that is like your salvation journey started with surrender and then the rest of your journey has been like open hands. This is who I am and this is an empty hand. God, what are you taking from who I am that doesn't need to be, any, doesn't need to be there anymore? It's not gonna produce fruit. It's not going to produce life. It's not gonna produce abundance. God, take from me or take from my identity, the way I see myself, the stuff that I don't need anymore. But as everyone, you know, who comes to know God, you also come with an open hand. And God's like, well, this is what I'm gonna place there instead. I'm gonna place security. I'm gonna place love. I'm gonna take rejection. I'm gonna put love in there. I'm gonna, uh, you know, reconstruct your identity so that you can live in the fullness of life that I died on the cross for you to have. So it's absolutely incredible. You know, um, I just, I'll skip that question. We'll, we might come back to it if we've got time. You both encountered God, right? And everything was smooth sailing from then, right? Because that's what happens when you encounter God. You know, everything's like easy. It's all open doors. It's all green lights. You know, that's how God works. And the fact that you guys are like, you're like, mm-hmm, it's not. <laughs> so it wasn't like that for you guys either. Um, Raylene, you talked about your journey with Mark, right? It wasn't all smooth sailing. Can you just maybe touch on a little bit of what that looked like, how God impacted you and how that then impacted your marriage? Yeah, it wasn't smooth sailing. You could imagine, you know, living with a, an alcoholic and me wanting to go God's way. Um, but the beautiful thing was that as I allowed my, my life in surrender to God and listening and being obedient to what He has asked me to do, it's, you know, sometimes you can just forget the little things along the way, but they're the little miracles that you've got to always remember. God's a miracle working God and sometimes He just does little miracles along the way to, to be a huge miracle in the end. And that's what He did with Mark. And, you know, and, and like 
some of the way through. He, at first it was like, oh, I don't want anything to do with your God. And then some of the way through, it would be like, oh, well, whatever, you can go to church and do whatever you wanna do. And then, and then he, I found him starting to stick up for me like, oh, don't you say anything about those Christians? My wife's one of them, you know? And, and so God, they're the little miracles along the way as, as you see answers to your prayer, you know, because every day I would pray for him. And the thing was that God didn't tell me it was gonna take so long, um, but God gave me hope along the way. And he kept taking me to scriptures and he, you know, he said, I'm gonna give him a new heart. You know, I've given you a new heart because my heart was so broken and God gave me a new heart. And he said that he was gonna take his stony heart and give him a new heart. And so I just kept hanging on to those scriptures, kept hanging on to the word and kept hanging on to God, you know, and, and on to Jesus. And, and some days it was hard because you couldn't see, you couldn't see the fruit of it when things were ugly and, and you know, through all what happened through it. But, you know, you just, you just hang on and you just have that hope and you just keep putting one foot in front of the other. And sometimes it might be just a little shuffle, but you don't stop. Because I found that when you stop, you fall off, you know. You have to keep moving. It's like on a bicycle. You just, just one foot in front of the other. Just keep walking. Just keep trusting. Just keep believing. Just keep your eyes on God. Don't look at what the world says because it's, it's loud. But just keep your hope in Him. And, and then one day you'll get your miracle. And there's a verse in the Old Testament, and I can't remember where it is, but it says, can God turn a nation in a day? And when I read that, I thought, no way, he can't turn a whole nation around in a day. But yes, he can, and he did. And if he can do that for a whole nation, he can do it for one person. And that's what he did for Mark. He turned his whole life around in one day. God is a God of hope and love. Amen. 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 It's so good. And some of you here might still remember um, you were here when Mark was alive. And honestly, incredible to watch what God had done in his life to, to that point. And it's just, it's true, right? Sometimes you can sit back and you're like, oh my gosh, is that, like, is that real? It was real. <laughs> I was there. We were there. <laughs> and can I just say that, you know, I had 10 years of, of him as a Christian. Yeah. And those 10 years were like 10,000 years. Yeah. And it was so worth the wait. It was so worth it. And when we walked into this church, everyone saw us as a couple, as a Christian. You know, they didn't know his past. They didn't know my past. And we just walked together and God just grew him so quickly. And, you know, we were leaders in this church. We, we, and he started the ministry in Thailand with me. And, you know, God is just so good what he did in those 10 years. And it was so worth it. Yeah. Awesome. I love that. <laughs> Jess, how did you hold on to the promise that God had given you? The promises God gave you while not knowing when the breakthrough would come, what it would look like, how you would make through, how did you hold on and persevere? So um, really early on, I, um, God said to me, you know, look, you need to be, you really need to be connected to the Word. You really, really need to be intentional about doing it. Um, and so I'm one of those crazy people who would spend, you know, eight hours a day reading the Word and I would just devour it and devour it and devour it. And I did that for probably, you know, the first 12 months, really. Um, and I would have, my house was plastered in Scriptures. And, you know, one of the most powerful things I would do when I was walking through those hard days is I would stand in my kitchen and I would find this little corner where the kids couldn't come in front of me and distract me. And I'd put on, you know, wireless earphones and I would blast the music and I would just worship until I would be on the floor absolutely surrendered where every single wall that I had put up had crumbled and all it was was me and Jesus. And those were the moments where I found the strength to continue on. Um, and that's how I held on to those promises. It was I would declare them frequently. I would hold them close to my heart. And like Mary said, you know, he, she treasured the things that were spoken to her, right? She treasured them. And that doesn't mean that you talk with everyone about them because not everyone has the faith, same faith journey as you. Not everyone understands what God's spoken to you. And not everyone understands your calling and what He's asked you to do. And so holding it close to your heart means that you ponder it, right? You constantly meditate on it. You constantly remind yourself in it. Um, and that comes to the next thing that I would do is that I would actually intentionally take time every single day to thank God for what He would, had done, to remember every single little miracle that He had done along the way and to thank Him for it. And then intentionally thank Him for the ones to come. 
Um, and so in doing those things along the way, they not just built my ex- expectation and my hope, but they also allowed me to step into His presence and allow the lies and the darts that the enemy throws at you to fall off. So it, re- it revived me and it, re- it strengthened me to keep walking. Um, and so that's some of the things that I intentionally did. And I had to intentionally do them, like choose to do them. Guys, it's really important um, that we understand that it's all a choice. Like faith is the conviction of the heart, but to have the conviction of the heart, you have to choose. You actually have to make the decision to go, well, it looks like this, but this is what God said. So regardless of what it looks like, my God is true. Like what He says will come to pass because nothing that He says falls to the ground, right? And He's not a man that He should lie. So I had to choose to go, no, I'm not choosing to accept this. I'm choosing to stand on this and do that even on those days when I didn't feel like it or I didn't have any strength left. I love that. I love that both of you have really demonstrated that God has so much for our lives. There is so much that He wants to do in our lives and the difference between getting to that point or or moving into those things for our life is the power to choose, the, the power of faith and then the power to continue walking even when it does take a lot of years. You know, it's holding that hope until it comes to pass. It's using practical strategies, which I really love. Um, I've just got two more questions for you guys. And this one, I think, is really relevant to a lot of women today. You know, there is such a pressure for perfection in Western culture. You know, and as a parent of little ones, mums can really feel trapped with that gnawing feeling. You know, that feeling that I need to strive to be better. Because what if I don't do enough? What if I'm not good enough? What if I screw my kid up? You know, you know, what, you know, how, how can I do this? How do you guys work through feelings like this, Raylene? How do you work through those feelings? Well, like I said before, the world's very loud, isn't it? And I don't think social media helps this. (laughs) You know, people can put a lovely little photo out there, but it's not reality. And reality is really, you know, being on the floor with your child or my grandchild and, you know, um, getting the place dirty and having, um, you know, chocolate faces or whatever you want to give them because grandma's nanas can do that. And then send them all back full of sugar. <laughs> you know, that, that's the reality. It's, it's not the perfection. It's not, you know, it's not what what you're trying to portray. It's just being real with God and being who God says for you to be to that child. And, you know, God's given you this, these children because He knew that you would be the best mother for that child and the best grandmother for that child. And, you know, there's no one else can do that job but you. And so, and no one can pray like a praying mother or a praying grandmother. Like my mother prays for all us children and all my grandchildren and, my, so, and her great-grandchildren. So, you know, no one can pray like a mum. And so, you know, you've just got to be real in who God says you to be and listen to Him and look to Him and not what the world says and not what the world's trying to portray. Just be real. Just be who He says you are and just act on and, and be purposeful to... to Act on that, what he says you to be. Yeah, fantastic. I'm just going to wrap it up in our last question, Jess. What would be one last thing that you would share with the church this morning that would encourage them in their motherhood journey, their parenting journey, um, to, I guess, wrap up everything that you've shared with us this morning? Um, so one of the things that I'd really love to leave you with is that we're not called to perfection. We're called to excellence. And there's such a difference. The world wants to see perfect and can never find it, which is why it's always trying to find somewhere else, right? It's always looking for more. That's why we always have that God-shaped hole in our heart. It's because He's the perfection that fills us and we can walk in excellence, right? And so I just want to leave that with you. You know, for every mum out there, for every parent out there, for every teenager, for every person sitting here, you aren't called to be perfect, you actually called to excellence. And that just means knowing who you are and acting out of your identity. You know, you're not broken anymore. You're actually whole, you're healed, you're loved, you're wanted, you're known by the one who actually sees every single flaw you have. And he still says you are very good. So there's nothing wrong with you. Um, And you have the freedom in Christ to be who you are and to live with peace. 
Oh, I love that. That's so good. Thank you, Jess. And Raylene, what would be one last thing that you would say today just to encourage everybody? Um, Always hold on to God. You know, times will come where you feel like you want to give up, where, you know, like I said, the world's screaming louder than everything else and you think this isn't working. But don't give up on God. Don't let go of Him because He's your only answer. And nothing else can satisfy like He can. And trust me, we have done, we've tried everything else. (laughs) Nothing else works. God is the only answer and He's the one who can change everything and turn everything around. So just don't ever um, take your eyes off Him, you know, keep your eyes posted and plastered on Him and receive His love. Thanks, Raylene. You know, I just want to thank you guys today. We, we are going to close because of the time, but I want to I thank you for your incredible faith. I'm glad that God met you all those years ago. I'm glad that you chose to pursue Him. I'm glad that you're using what is in your life to bless the Kingdom of God because you really are a blessing. And we're so glad that you're part of this church. Church, can we just um, thank these guys for stay for a minute? You know, I hope that you've been inspired. I hope that you've been encouraged. Obviously, there is a significant amount, uh, a lot more to their stories um, that come and talk to them. Talk to them after church. Uh, Actually, after church, if you are anyone here and you feel like, you know, I need prayer, I need encouragement in my motherhood journey or there's something that you're facing, Raylene and Jess are gonna be available after the service. We're just gonna be standing here at the front. Uh, Come and... We're here available for that. But I just wanted to leave you guys with some further resources and some information on where to from here. And the first, I just wanna note too, they're gonna go up on the screen. The first is that uh, Raylene actually has written a book from victim to victor, and uh, which is absolutely incredible. She has copies in the foyer at the Connect desk after the service, if you'd like to grab a hold of those. Um, Raylene's just said, if you wanna make a donation to LAM, which is her, um, the orphanages overseas, um, that would be fantastic. Also, Jess is running an online prophetic course uh, with Spirit-Led Ministries. You'll find the uh, link up on the stage as well. I would get on that. You know, uh, we are running an in-person one here at church. We're up to our fifth session. Uh, We are in a day and age where we need to hear the voice of God like never before. Our world needs it, we need it. And so I encourage you to check that out. There's some other resources up there as well. But we wanna thank you guys. So I'd love it if we could just thank these women again for everything that they brought today.